us today. Um, Carl has a PhD in history and philosophy of science from the University of Pittsburgh. He also has a master's degree in neuroscience um, from Pitt as well. And he's currently full professor in the Department of Philosophy and the Philosophy, Neuroscience, and Psychology program at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, Carl is best known for his seminal work on understanding explanation in neuroscience and biology as mechanistic. His revolutionary book, Explaining the Brain, Mechanisms in the Mosaic Unity of Neuroscience, published by Oxford University Press in 2007, has received over 975 citations. In it, he develops a framework for thinking about the norms of explanation in physiological sciences like neuroscience. In his numerous articles, of which there are over 50 um, that have appeared in top journals, including Philosophy of Science and Synthetics, he has treated of mechanistic explanation in a rich array of related topics, including scientific discovery, intervention, natural kind, realization and unity of science, to name only a handful. He also co-authored a book with Lindley Darden, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2013, entitled Searching for Mechanisms, Discoveries Across the Life Sciences, which develops a mechanistic account of discovering biology. Um, it's, Carl's work has had widespread, and indeed worldwide impact, um, in building and shaping the nascent field of philosophy of neuroscience. Not only has his work prompted philosophers of science of different stripes from physics to the social sciences to become interested in mechanistic explanation and related topics, but it has also inspired a new and enthusiastic generation of young philosophers of science who are all working on interesting issues arising from Carl's work, many of them self-identifying philosophers of neuroscience. Tomorrow at 3.30, Carl will give a talk on the ontic account of network explanation and information about that talk is available on the Rotman website. Today he will be speaking to us about some really cool work he's doing in collaboration with cognitive neuroscientist Shana Rosenbaum at York University to investigate deficits of agency and moral reasoning in people with amnesia. The title of his talk is Memory, Time, and Agency. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Carl Kramer. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming today, and it's a real delight to be here. I've really enjoyed talking to people all through the day today and meeting many of the graduate students, and it's very exciting to see that this is a place where philosophy and the sciences play well together, where the students are actually working in laboratories and learning something about how, how the science works from the ground up, because it's one thing, as, you, as all of you who do science know, to learn something about science by reading review articles, it's another thing entirely to actually get into your labs and get, into, get your hands dirty. So I think it's just so exciting that you're doing that. Um, I've been trying to, to do that in various ways over the course of my career, and today I'm going to talk about one slice through that, um, and it's my foray into neuropsychology, which has always been interesting to me. I suppose from the day that I first read The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, I was sold on the, on the, the value of this discipline and how interesting it was. But I, it was really when I met uh, Endel Talving one day rather fortuitously while giving a talk on uh, memory and ethics um, uh, that, that everything came together. He invited me to come to Toronto and Mississauga in particular to, to meet a person that he had worked with named KC, who's represented here in a photo at his brother's uh, the wedding, uh, who because of a, a motorcycle accident, an automobile accident, and having been hit on the head by a bale of hay at some point, um, uh, uh, ended up with a rather severe memory deficit, a loss of episodic memory, roughly the inability to uh, remember any of the experiences of his life or to remember any of the new ones that he was having. Now to a philosopher this was an exciting possibility because many people have claimed that this form of memory, not just Endel, uh, uh, but other people have claimed that this form of memory is really central to our status as people, um, uh, to our ability to plan for the future, to our ability to know ourselves, uh, to our ability to be the same person over uh, uh, periods of time. And so somebody who's lost that capacity but maintained much of the rest of their cognitive capacity offers a unique opportunity to explore what the life of a person looks like in the absence of this putatively very important cognitive capacity. And before I, just so I don't forget at the end, I just have to be incredibly grateful to the people that I've been lucky enough to work with, in particular Donna Kwan and Shana Rosenbaum at York University. Shana was her advisor. Shana is just one of the most terrific uh, collaborators that one could hope for and has really done an amazing 
a, a job helping me to do this work better and helping to, to, to find concrete ways to test the high uh, abstract philosophical ideas that I was interested in. Um, some of the work that I've done here also involves Melissa Duff from Iowa, and much of the, the work that I'll talk about on discounting in particular came from my discussions with my colleague Pascal Boyer, and uh, helped considerably by my work with Len Green and Joel Meyerson, who are the kings of discounting, I think. And then um, two graduate students that I've worked with, Nazem Kaven, who has just finished his PhD, and Jake Kerchek, who also had a postdoc with Shana for a period of time, are involved in the moral reasoning studies that I'll talk about at the end. Big picture, though. Uh, um, uh, you can look at anyone in this room and you can approach them from two vastly different perspectives. On the one hand, you can see them as persons and understand them in terms of their agential and their uh, epistemic competencies and proprieties. We talk about them as making choices, as undertaking commitments, as having responsibilities and being responsible for their actions, of undertaking various sorts of obligations and having various sorts of proprieties. On the other hand, those of us who've spent some time thinking about cognitive science and thinking about neuroscience, we recognize that we can also look at one another and see a bundle of machines located within skin. Right? Human beings here are assembl assemblages of dissociable, co more or less dissociable cognitive capacities and mechanisms, like episodic memory, working memory, attention, and the like, co-localized in a body. Um, and the question is, how do we bring these two visions of the human organism into a stereopsis with one another? How do we see, reconcile them with one another? When we view one another as machines, this language of responsibility, obligation, and the like seems to disappear from our sights. And when we talk about people in those first kinds of terms, the, it's very difficult to see them at the same time as machine-like. Um, I think there are really two kinds of conceptual questions here. This is going to go much better if I get my glasses. Really, uh, two kinds of questions here that I think really call for the interaction between philosophers and, and cognitive scientists on these issues. On the one hand, there's like a conceptual question. What, one must, what must one be able to do to deserve a given status in the space of reasons? What makes somebody a moral patient? What makes them a moral agent? What makes them somebody who can properly be said to reason? And why are those features important? Those seem to me to be conceptual questions in the traditional domain of philosophy. But on the other hand, there's a question, what cognitive capacities must be in place for us to be able to do those things? And for me, that's in the traditional domain of cognitive science. And in particular today, I'm going to be addressing these conceptual issues. What must one be able to do to deserve the status of an agent? That's what I'm particularly interested in. Must they be able to construct counterfactuals and evaluate their truth? Must they be able to value the future or orient themselves in time? Must they be able to tell some sort of narrative about their life or have an understanding of who they are? Today, I'm going to be mostly interested in their ability to orient themselves in time and their ability to make prudential choices and moral choices. Right? Um, and then there's an empirical question, can people who lack episodic memory do those things? And if the answer to that question is no, then we might have some hint, though not demonstrative proof, that episodic memory is really quite crucial to our status as agents, and we will drop some kind of tethering line between that view of agents as uh, occupying the space of reasons and our viewing agents as uh, occupying the space of causes. The method that I'm going to use here, and for today I might as well be a Colt Hardian uh, ultra-cognitivist, um, uh, is a dissociation method. And according to this method, you demonstrate that one can lose capacity A while maintaining capacity B, and you conclude that therefore A is not necessary for capacity B, and this is a way of suggesting a kind of causal independence between the two, that A does not, uh, uh, that B does not require one to have A. So in all of the examples that I'm going to give today, they will have the following form, that episodic memory can be selectively damaged, leaving decision-making or time, sense of time intact. Therefore, episodic memory is not necessary for these aspects of decision-making. That's the trick that will be repeated throughout this talk, all right? And I want to emphasize from the very start that I'm not engaged in localization here. Uh, the, the cases that I'm talking about in many cases have widespread brain damage, making it very difficult to tell what area of the brain is implicated in their deficits. What matters for me is the cognitive level description, that they lack this one cognitive capacity but maintain these others. Now, since there are philosophers in the room, I know that you're special philosophers because you care about science, but I feel like I have to do this. Why not just imagine? 
<laughs> Why not just imagine it and draw conclusions on the basis of your imagination? Well, in fictional cases, the author chooses how to characterize the deficit. Memento is a lovely story, but it's a story made by a director about what he thinks somebody with amnesia would look like in the real world, but there's a real question about whether Leonard in Memento is anything like what real amnesics are like. The author also chooses how to specify the relationship between the deficit and other cognitive capacities. So if they think that self-knowledge is, is, requires episodic memory, then their fictional character will lack both episodic memory and self-knowledge. But it's not clear that those things have to go together. The author fills in the unknowns, in other words, with reasonable values. But in clinical cases, the world determines which variables are relevant. The world determines which variables depend on one another. And the world fills in the unknowns with actual values. The world, for me, is its own best representation. And trying to draw conclusions about the status of the mind or personhood and its relationship to the underlying cognitive capacities on the basis of fictional stories strikes me as just hubris. OK. Um, uh, that's it. I'll, I won't go on. You get the point. Uh, episodic memory, a working sketch. For those of you who haven't uh, encountered this phenomenon before, it's a little weird. And here, I'm not, I'm not committing myself to this. In fact, I'm having serious doubts about this taxonomy as time goes on. But, um, uh, but we can get it started just this way. When we talk about episodic memory, we, and Endel has a list of many different features that are shared by episodic memory and semantic memory. But episodic memory um, deals with our personal past, um, it tends to be described as experiential, that is, uh, sensorily loaded, um, uh, 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 it, that it's hot and contains emotional experiences, that it's organized in time and in space, um, and uh, that, uh, well, forget this one. Um, that's for the philosophers. Um, uh, but, but for instance, if we imagine ourselves riding on a uh, roller coaster, uh, we might you know, remember ascending the first hill and feel our heart starting to pound a little bit. We look to the right, there's a parking lot. We look to the left, there are people eating cotton candy. Uh, then the, suddenly the thing starts to go over the top. I look at my daughter, she's screaming. Uh, you know, I can redo this, this memory for you. Um, and when I'm doing that kind of thing, I'm engaged paradigmatically in a form of episodic memory, spatially and temporally organized, hot, emotionally and, and visually rich, uh, perceptually rich. Uh, remembering. On the other hand, semantic memory involves memory of facts, such as, and, and those can, don't have to be in our past. They might be in the past, the present, or the future. I can remember that I'm currently in London, Ontario. I can remember that tomorrow I have a doctor's appointment, and I can remember that uh, yesterday Trump did something silly. Um, uh, uh, these things tend to be propositional, that is, there's a that clause in them, followed by a, a, a some content. They tend to be cold in the sense that it, it doesn't come with any emot emotive content. I can think that I'm in um, uh, London, Ontario, without that evoking any strong emotional reaction. And they tend to be conceptually organized with one another rather than spatially and temporally organized. Now, um, a standard definition is that episodic memories are memories of past personal events accompanied by awareness of previous experience of the event, um, what Endel Tolving calls autonoetic consciousness. And this has become associated with, in the literature with the notion of mental time travel, the ability to transport oneself mentally in time. Part of what I think has happened in the literature on episodic memory is that these terms, like mental time travel, autonoetic consciousness, have taken on a life of their own and have led people to make claims about people with episodic memory deficits that go bar, far beyond anything that's actually been demonstrated. One example of this kind of extension of the thought can be found in Buckner and Carroll's 2007 article where they imagine that there's, where they uh, hypothesize that there's a projection system in the brain. Uh, uh, that this one system is not just responsible for recalling hot experiences about our past, but for vividly imagining future experiences as shown. Uh, it, this is the present here in the middle. And the thought is that in the top there, we're projecting ourselves into a future, or no, no sorry, that's episodic memory, where we're looking back at, at, at the picnic that we've just had, or we can imagine ourselves in the future where we're helping to put things away. And then the thought was, maybe it extends even further uh, maybe it extends to us going into the perspective of another person. I think this is a person irritated with us for not helping to clean up after the picnic. And then in this screen, uh, a different spatial, loc spatial orientation on the same scene. And the thought was that there might be one unified system in the brain that's responsible for all of these things, and that people with episodic memory deficit have not just lost their ability to reconstruct their past, but they've also lost the ability to reconstruct these vivid personal futures 
and their ability to project themselves into the minds of others, and their ability to project themselves into other spatial orientations. Now, my colleague, Shana uh, Rosenbaum, has established, I think, quite conclusively that, that this claim is false, that it's perfectly possible for people with episodic memory deficits to understand the minds of other creatures. They can understand facial expressions and know what emotions they represent. They get sarcasm. They understand how to complete stories and what the characters in stories might be thinking. Um, and so this, this claim has just turned out not to work very well. But the other ones, I think, are still, to some extent, live options. Part of the reason why people have thought that this is a plausible idea, especially involving the future, is this conversation that Endel Tolving had with KC at some point, which is now repeated in almost every article on this topic. And it goes like this. Endel says, let's try the question again about the future. What will you be doing tomorrow? And KC says, I don't know. Um, well, do you remember the question? Uh, you mean about what I'll be doing tomorrow? Yeah. How would you describe your state of mind when you try to think of it? There's a five-second pause, and then KC says, well, blank, I guess. And, if you, and, you, and, and at other places, he says that it's like being asleep, that it's a big blankness sort of thing, that it's like being in a room and having, with nothing there and having a guy tell you to go find a chair and there's nothing there, or that it's like swimming in the middle of a lake and there's nothing there to hold you up or to do anything with. These are pretty bleak and empty pictures that he's painting of his future. And I think it's partly this that led Sachs to describe Jimmy G, the lost mariner, as somebody who's adrift on a sea of time, a lost mariner, um, uh, unanchored to any moment in time. And of course, the idea that people with amnesia are somehow stuck, stuck in the present, is ubiquitous in science and outside of science. Sue Corkin, in her uh, retrospective book on a lifetime of working with uh, HM, titles the book Permanent present tense to emphasize this aspect of the deficit. Clearly, the, the video memento being shot in reverse is attempting to get something of the temporal orientation and the fact that Leonard only has access to this moment. And when we teach this kind of stuff to our undergraduate students, many people will uh, appeal to the, the, the classic uh, case of, oh god, why am I blanking on his name all of a sudden? Who? Clive Waring, thank you very much. Uh, Clive Waring, who in his, in his diary used to write, um, let's see, now I am perfectly awake. Now I am perfectly awake, scratch. Now I am over and over and over again. One might think that this reflects something of obsessive behavior uh, in, uh, in addition. I, I think that's, that's serious. It's not clear to me that, that he's a clean case of an episodic memory deficit without other kinds of, of issues. But then you find other people who now take this idea and they run with it. Um, uh, if we Endel Tolving, if we retained all our other mental capacities but lost the awareness of time in which our lives played out, we might still be uniquely different from all other animals, but we would no longer be human as we understand it. Roberts asks in a way that I think is, is pretty insulting, actually, do animals have a sense of time, episodic memory, and an ability to cognitively project their activities into the future? Or are animals permanently similar to KC and to children under the age of four? Could animals be largely stuck in a permanent present with little ability to remember past episodes or plan activities for the future? Dalabarba and Lacourt have really pushed this even further at this point. Um, uh, hippocampal damage cannot be considered pure episodic memory deficits, but rather pathological conditions affecting an individual's entire subjective temporality. So it's not just a memory deficit anymore. It's now affecting your entire sense of time and your place in it. All right, so here's the way the talk's going to go. Um, uh, I'm going to start with semantic knowledge of time and then move to their attitudes about the future and their attitudes about the past. And then I'm going to look at some stuff on impulsivity and risk, um, the extent to which they value the future, uh, the extent to how they modulate the value of future with imagining the future. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk about anticipating regret. I forgot to take that one out. I will talk about making moral judgments, moral decisions, and then I'm going to stop. Right? Now, if, if, this, if you're stuck in the present with no concept of the, your personal future, and no concept of the past, you are really hurting as an agent. Because you don't have any idea that you're going to do something, that what you're going to do has consequences, that there is a future to even be concerned about. And why in the world would you care about rewards and punishments that are coming to you in the future if the future does not, in fact, exist? So these words, mental time travel, stuck in time, 
have an, has have a resonance that goes far beyond the, the evidence that we've got concerning these people. All right, so the, po the point was to test some of those things. Do they have semantic knowledge of time? How do you test that? Well, we had to figure something out. Turns out philosophers here have been somewhat helpful. It's not Hurl 1998. He's the first person to have claimed that somebody with an episodic memory deficit would not have a sense of time um, uh, in print. All right? um, but, but here he makes use of, and we made use of, uh, the, a distinction that, that goes back to McTaggart from 1920s, perhaps, um, uh, distinction between the A series and the B series. The, the terms don't matter. Um, uh, the idea of the A series is that time flows, that there's a past, a present, and a future, and that time is, as it were, that the, there's a now moving towards the future, and that things in the future become present and then recede into the past, a kind of flowing notion of time. McTaggart would hate that way of describing it. Um, uh, it has a direction to it. There's a causal asymmetry that's a result of it, um, so that things in the future cannot affect things in the past, because time is only moving this way. Um, a second notion of time, which I understand is popular among physicists, is the idea that time is just a sequence of events ordered as earlier to later, or earlier and later than one another. On that picture, there is no now moving through it all. It's just a bunch of events that can be put in an ordered series with one another. And philosophers have worried about you know, whether which one of these is the primitive concept of time and which one can be derived from the others, that's not my concern today. Today it's just to indicate there are two ways of thinking about time and to ask the question, does KC or other people with amnesia think about time in these ways? So does he have a concept of the B series? In the case, this is KC. We gave KC a list of events from his life, um, events that he would probably list if you asked him, in fact. They include things like, you know, his brother Jeffrey being born, or being in a motorcycle accident, or uh, going to the expo in Montreal, uh, things like that. And um, we asked him to put them on a, on a, on a timeline. And it turns out that he, he was able to do that quite well. In fact, the only ones that he missed are the ones that are circled. Perm is when he decided at the last minute to give himself a permanent before his brother's wedding to surprise the family, which he has actually no memory of having done. Um, uh, the only ones that he gets wrong besides those are things that he did not attend, the expo, and cases where he lost consciousness, like his motorcycle accident, his VW bug accident, and his being hit on the head by a bale of hay. Those are the ones that are out of place, but the rest of them right where they're supposed to be in the order of time. Then we wanted to know, like, does he really understand that time moves on? After all, he's trapped in the present. Um, what is the future, we asked him. Uh, well, there are events that haven't happened yet. Uh, what is the past? Well, there are events that have already happened. Can you change the past? No. Can you change the future? Yes. How? By doing different things. Um, does what happened in the past influence what happens in the future? He says, yes. By the way, Casey is not very loquacious. <laughs> um, uh, when we talk to people who have developmental amnesia, which I'll mention in just a second, we get these, these very long and excited answers to these questions. I'm not going to read them all to you, but, but this will give you the, the, the bare bones of the thing quickly. Um, does what you do now influence what happens in the future? He says, yeah, I guess so. Does what you do now change what happened in the past? No. Can something that happens in the future change what happens in the past? No. If an event is in the future, will it always be in the future? No. Why, he says, because time moves on. Once an event is in the past, will it always stay in the past? He says, yes. Suppose someone commits murder. Is it possible for them to undo what they did at some future time? The answer is no. We asked him, have you ever heard a story about time travel? Can you say what it means to travel in time? And he says, hmm, to take a body and move it to a previous era. All these answers seem to suggest at least a semantic familiarity with the notions of the past, the present, and the future. And given that he's able to order things on a timeline, he seems to have the B series. KC seems to have the A series and the B series. And we've now replicated this in two other cases of acquired, am acquired amnesia. And we've also done it in two individuals with developmental amnesia, John and HC. 
Um, both of them were born with hippocampal damage and never really acquired the capacity to um, develop episodic memory or fully functioning episodic mem memory, but they fluidly answer all of these questions. And in some cases, the questions go a little bit, they, go, they get quite animated about it. They start talking about relativity, and it depends on how fast you're going, and, and, and that kind of stuff, suggesting that the answers, it's not clear what the right answers to all these questions are, as anyone who's taken a philosophy of time course knows. What mattered to us was that they give answers that would be roughly equivalent to the ones that you would get out of your freshman, your first year students when you um, uh, ask them these questions. And that's what we get. So what we conclude about this is that either episodic memory is unnecessary to acqu acquire or possess conceptual knowledge of time, the A series and the B series, or the individuals with developmental amnesia build conceptual knowledge of the A series from what few episodic memories remain. It's impossible to say that they have a complete episodic memory deficit. Um, but it does seem to me that knowledge of the A series is semantic knowledge, and so there is every reason to expect in the first place that somebody who just lost episodic memory would keep all of the semantic knowledge that they had about time, and there is some reason to think that they might be able to acquire that semantic knowledge via a route that's independent of their, ep their episodic experiences. All right, that's one thing, but what do they, do they care? <laughs> they might know that there's time and that there's a future and a past and a present, but do they think that the future is somehow more important to them than the past, or what, what are their attitudes about time? One intuition is that if you can't imagine that you have a personal future or remember your personal past, that you would think that they were irrelevant to you if you're stuck in the present. Episodic amnesics, if that's the case, then episodic amnesics would be myopically focused on the present with little concern for their past and their future. And then they would be really limited as agents. They'd be present hedonists, you might think. These are what Zimbardo calls people oriented towards the hedonistic present. They're self-indulgent pleasure seekers, shirking all exacting work. And Zimbardo says that he's one of these. Um, uh, and Zimbardo has developed a test that he's used in many different contexts that sort of gets at people's attitudes about past, present, and future. You might also think that they'd be fatalist, um, after all, Casey's been living, you know, lived, he's now uh, passed away, uh, but he lived with his parents for 30 some years, um, and you might think that he might come to the conclusion that nothing in his life really matters. And so if people with amnesia can't even imagine a future or remember anything that they've done, maybe they should just think that nothing that they do really matters. And that, that would be an understandable reaction to the situation, after all. So we gave them this Zimbardo test. I won't read you through it, but it's just a bunch of questions. Is it, is it more important to party tonight than get your work done? You know, um, uh, I always do the dishes before I go to bed. Those kinds of things, right? And this graph, which is really very busy, and, what, uh, and what's really going to matter is just here, these two hypotheses that we're asking about fatalism and hedonism. Um, uh, but what this represents, the 50th percentile across all of these dimensions is right here in the middle, right? And this one over here is uh, their negativity about the past. Everyone's always been mean to me. My mother didn't like me. I was beaten and kicked. Um, this is positivity about the past. You know, I have great fond memories of going to the lake with my family. Um, fatalism uh, is fatalism. Uh, present hedonism is present hedonism. And future orientation is something like, I like to plan for the future. I like to get all my ducks in a row before I go to bed so that my tomorrow will be more efficiently taken care of. And I put money away in the bank in order to save for a distant future, that kind of stuff. Right? But what's really interesting here is that on measures of pre present hedonism, KC, the blue one, uh, oh, and one last thing. Um, this red dot uh, here with the dotted line, that's Zimbardo's idea of the good life. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's, that's all it is. A little bit pat negative about your past, not very much. Um, uh, very positive about your past, not especially fatalistic, a little bit hedonistic, a little bit future-oriented in balance with one another. All right? What matters here, and we're all different on this. We're all going to score differently on this scale. But what matters here is that KC is hitting it at the absolute floor on measures of present hedonism. And you'll see that these other people, the highest score that we get on present hedonism is uh, HC, and she's at, at the 50th percentile, right? And similarly, on fatalism, we don't even get anyone who hits the 50th percentile. So the fact that they don't think about the future, imagine the future, or remember their past, does, and, and doesn't seem to trap them value-wise 
to the present. They value things that are outside of that domain. So if they are trapped in the present in some sense, they're trapped there valuing the future and valuing their past and doing so roughly like the rest of us. Uh, rest of us. In fact, if you look at their dominant time, this, you can't read this from out there, um, uh, but the dominant time perspective for these guys tended to be, oddly, positivity about their past. That's pretty weird. And in some cases, future orientation. I say that's weird in part um, because I think what we're really tapping into here is not anything episodic at all, uh, but rather semantic knowledge of the right answers to these questions. I shouldn't be that hedonistic. I shouldn't be that fatalistic. That's not the way that one should answer these questions. And I think that he knows the, these guys know the answer to those questions, and they're giving them to us. So the conclusions that I want to draw about temporal perspective is that episodic amnesics don't avow a hedonistic temporal orientation, and they're not notably fatalistic. But you say they talk the talk, but do they really walk the walk? I mean, what if you take them to a casino? What kind of behavior are you going to see then? So then we wanted to look at impulsivity and risk. And you might make the intuitive prediction that somebody who's trapped in a permanent present, the way that Sue Corkin describes HM, uh, would not be able to imagine a, a personal future. And so will choose impulsively, that as soon as they have the opportunity to act on something that they want, boom, they'll, they'll, they'll go for it. On the other hand, you might think that the future is nothing to them. They can't really even imagine the time that they, wreck, that they land. Um, and so since they can't imagine the time that they land, why not do this? Right? Um, so you'd think a person who can't imagine a personal future will be prone to risky behavior. And Sudendorf and Corbalis claim that MIT gives us knowledge, that, that uh, mental time travel gives us knowledge of our own mortality, which I would think is semantic um, uh, knowledge, if anything is, but um, uh, certainly not episodically gained. I don't even know what it's like to imagine being dead, as Epicurus pointed out a long time ago. Um, uh, uh, and you know, there are all these famous hypotheses that only humans can flexibly anticipate their future mental states of need and act in the present to secure them. And so this idea that episodic memory might be distinctively human feeds into this sort of thought. But is it true? Well, we had to find a test that you could do with people who are cognitively impaired that will separate out these two components. It's hard to tell whether somebody's being impulsive or whether they just like to gamble, right? And so this task that was developed by Darlene Floden um, and, and uh, suggested to me by Shana um, really separates out these two things. You, you give them a screen. On the screen are presented a series of cards. The cards can be presented in ascending or descending order. So uh, in the top, you start with five, and then four, three, two, one. Um, in the bottom, one, two, three, four, five. And they tap the screen when they want to stop things, or they hit a, hit a button and, and make things stop. The cards are turned over. If the winning card is beneath, they win a, an award that's um, uh, 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 proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the number of cards that are presented. So there's something that's sort of tempting them a bit down this end right? um, and away from all the way out here. Now, somebody who is uh, impulsive that is, acts only on the first opportunity for acting, that's how we're operationalizing it here, should choose with five cards in the de or five or four cards in the descending presentation, but with one or two cards in the ascending presentation. Somebody who likes risk and likes to gamble should in both cases wait until there are very few cards present because they're going to win a larger reward even though their probability of winning is low. So in these two presentations, we can separate out the situation. This is what somebody who's impulsive looks like. In the subtracting condition, they choose with many cards. In the adding condition, with few. This is somebody who's neither. This is somebody who's a risk taker. And KC, in particular, doesn't look like either of these. And now we've replicated this on several subjects. And we don't find any evidence that these guys are either impulsive or essentially risk takers. And in order to assess whether these people are able to calculate out risk, we looked at their probabilistic discounting. Um, uh, how much would you pay for a 90% 90 90 chance of winning a dollar? Um, and just to see whether their discounting curves looked like the rest of ours, here we're looking at KC, DA, HC, and DG. And they're all in different age groups, so we needed different controls for all of them. At the top, we've got uh, a reward of 250. At the bottom, we've got a reward of 2,000. Um, uh, the reason that we looked at these two uh, was to see if they exhibit amount, an amount effect, namely that um, we tend to discount 
let me make sure I get this right, we tend to, to discount uh, uh, larger rewards more steeply than we do uh, smaller rewards. And it, it, we don't really know why. It's just sort of a quirk of things. But it turns out that you can see just from looking at this that these lines of the, the performance of the patients, or, sorry, the individuals with episodic amnesia and the controls are right on top of one another. In one case, I guess KC discounts slightly shallower than the rest, but that's not really what you would expect. You might expect them to just drop off the cliff. So what we want to say here is that the conclusions on risk-taking and impulsivity are that individuals with episodic amnesia are not prone to impulsive behavior as measured on the floatum task, and they're not prone to risk-taking, also measured on the floatum task, and also indicated by the fact that they'll do probabilistic discounting very much like the rest of us. But maybe probability is not what we're most concerned about. It's time. We all de de devalue the future. And maybe that's why global warming is so hard of a problem to solve in some ways, or why Trump continues to gain in popularity in the United States. Um, uh, but we don't, the future doesn't matter as much to us as the present. You can be asked, like, how much would you pay today for $100 in 10 years? How much would you, be pay, how much would you pay today for $100 in a month? How much would you pay today for $100 in a week? And the thought is that we all exhibit a kind of discounting curve where that value drops off as the temporal distance to the receipt of the reward increases in time. Now, again, all of us are going to have different discounting curves. Um, some of us don't care much about the future and the thing just plummets. Uh, some of us are really conservative and end up up here. Um, uh, but what we want to see is whether people with episodic amnesia do this radically differently than the rest of us. One prediction that you might make is they would discount really sharply. If they're stuck in the present with no idea of the future, then, then if I say, I'll give you, you know, how much are you going to give me for $100 in, in 10 years? And they say, I, I know nothing of 10 years. Give me the dollar now. Right? Um, uh, Alternatively, one story about why we do this, why we discount the future, is if I say, I'll give you like a plate of cookies right now, or I'll give you, you know, double the number of cookies um, uh, in a week, um, that you think, um, oh God, I don't know if I can wait for the cookies. And, and, and it's going to be so painful knowing that the cookies are coming, and I'm not yet getting the cookies, and so um, uh, I... Uh, uh, you get the idea, that you, you discount the value of the reward by, the, by subtracting the pain of waiting. Right? And if that's the case, and people with episodic amnesia can't imagine, anticipate their personal pain of waiting, then you would expect them not to, they'll just take the larger reward regardless of how far in the future it is. Either of those work. But it turns out they're no different than the rest of us. Neither of those predictions turns out to be right. Again, these are the same people, KC, DA, HC, and, and DG. Again, two different values in these cases. Um, uh, and uh, the one that's a bit odd in these cases, the, the curves just line up with one another really very beautifully. The one that's a bit odd in these cases is, uh, uh, let's see, this is, this is KC who does seem to be a little bit more steep in his discounting here than controls. But then if you look down here, he's less steep than the controls. It flips around exactly the opposite way. DA up here just said that he calculates the interest. He was an accountant before he had his deficit. If you ask KC, how'd you do this? Can you, show, uh, uh, can you say how you thought about these decisions? He says, I don't know. Um, gut reaction? Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to take that amount? And he goes, uh, no reason. What would you use it for? No idea. How do you decide which amount to take? Well, I think of what sounds like a better deal. That's a great semantic answer. <laughs> Are you thinking about what you would spend it on? No. Is there anything you would spend it on? No. If you had to guess what would you do with it, I'd put it in the bank. Right? And if you really lean on him, if you really lean on him, which I have done a couple of times, he says, I'd, okay, I'd buy beer. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> what kind of beer? Black label. That was the answer. And the others. Uh, DA says that he made strictly economic decisions, accounting for interest rates and inflation, as you, inflation, as you might imagine. AC, who's a little more bubbly and younger, uh, says that she would try to estimate how long she'd be able to hold out and said that she would spend the money on her wedding. And DG said it was a gut feeling. All right. So concerning prediction number one, individuals with episodic amnesia do not always choose the immediate reward. They don't discount more steeply than controls. 
So episodic projection does not seem to be required for one to value future rewards. And valuing future rewards is really essential for one to be an agent. So if one couldn't imagine a future of value for, in fact, uh, debates about abortion often turn on the question of whether the thing ha can conceive of a future of value for itself. Right? Um, and that's a sign of marking the distance between a per difference between a person and, and, a, and something non-person-like. Right? Discounting conclusions number two, um, individuals with episodic amnesia discount the future despite their inability to imagine the pain, to, pain of waiting, and that just seems to suggest that episodic imagination of future pain is not necessary to explain the human tendency to discount the value of future rewards. Okay, how am I doing on time? I've got about like 10 minutes, something like that. Is that, is that fair? Is that roughly how long these things go? Okay. Cueing effects. So one thing that people have been discovering recently that also tends to support the idea that episodic memory plays a, a crucial role in discounting behavior um, uh, is that if we ask people to imagine the future in which they will receive the award, I'm gonna give you $100 in, in uh, two months but now I want you to imagine yourself two months from now spending that money on something that you like, like for instance, you know, I, I don't know, you know, going on a shopping spree. And I want you to imagine spending, what would you spend that money on? And then they think about that and now they discount shallower, more shallowly than they would if they hadn't been put in that imaginative scenario. So in this case, we, uh, and, in, and in these cases we went to their family members or talked with them directly or consulted their calendars, and we found events that were actually in their future. And then we would give them a scream where we say, like, you know, imagine your 40th wedding anniversary that's coming up in three years. Or imagine your wedding, HC, you know, and you could have this money to spend it on your wedding, right? And then we asked them, which would you prefer to receive, 50 bucks now or 100 bucks then? Right? And then they have to click to make their decision after they've been presented with that screen. And like I said, in controls, if you do this, it nudges, it, 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 it makes them discount less shallowly. Uh, presumably, and the thought is that this episodic future imagining is, um, is being imported into the present and adjusting upward the value of that future reward. Here we got really mixed results, I have to admit. Um, in some cases, BL and DG, we got the, we got the effect that imagining their future, um, uh, the future reward actually did reduce the, their tendency to discount the value of the future. For KC, it made it worse. It went in the opposite direction. He discounted it more. And for these guys, there was no difference whatsoever. But if we look at the extent of their deficit, and the extent of the cueing effect, we find no correlation whatsoever between those, those two. And in fact, if you look at the overlapping scores here for the control subjects here and the cases over here, there's complete overlap between the two cases. Remember, we're all different in this effect, right? So, so the fact that these are such overlapping um, distributions suggests that we're not dealing with two different things. We're dealing with the same kind of response profile. So I conclude from this that, uh, well, it's a mess. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure what to say. All right, the last thing that I want to, I think this is the last one that I want to talk about. It's the most recent one that, we're, that we just uh, got accepted into Hippocampus. Um, this is what I'll call the Darwin hypothesis about moral judgment. Uh, and I just found this because I was teaching Darwin last semester and I was really struck by these passages from The Descent of Man where um, uh, Darwin says that a moral being is one who's capable of reflecting on his past actions and their motives of approving some and disapproving others. So if you lost the capacity to do this for Darwin, you're, you're not a moral agent, right? Uh, he says that a pointer dog... He was fond of his pointer dogs. A pointer dog, if able to reflect on its past conduct, would say to himself, I ought to have pointed at that hare and not have yielded to the passing temptation of hunting it. Right? Um, um, and then he, then he suggests that we ought to cultivate this in people, that whatever renders the imagination more vivid and strengthens the habit of recalling and comparing past impressions will make the conscience more sensitive and may even somewhat compensate for weak social affections and sympathies. And so very strong statements. But you can find these kinds of claims made more recently. William Casebeer and, and uh, Patricia Churchland claim that uh, 
that, if moral, that in moral judgment it appears that the hippocampus facilitates conscious recollection of schemas and memories that permit past events to figure in current decisions. This recollection is dependent on hippocampal structures. Or over here, Paul Thagard, uh, Waterloo, effective decision making requires integration of reasoning with positive and negative emotional reactions based on memories of previous experiences. Or down here, where people claim that if you've got a, a damaged hippocampus, you're more likely to be a moral deviant, a murderer, a psychopath, or a pedophiliac. I don't know where to begin to answer these questions about moral decision making, but one thing to do is to just take something off the shelf and see what happens. Uh, and in this case, that's what I did. Um, uh, I'm not crazy about this test for a variety of reasons that we can discuss. Uh, but here's roughly how the picture goes. I'm just going to present it straight out and we can discuss the nuances later if we want to. The idea is that there are two kinds of moral decisions that we might make or two kinds of moral decision makers, one of which is deontological in character, something like killing a person is wrong. These things tend to be categorical and, and not admitting of exceptions. Or we make utilitarian judgments about the on balance, goodness or badness of a given act for, for ourselves and other people. Killing would be wrong only if the costs outweigh the benefits. According to Josh Green's dual process model, um, vivid personal emotional experiences drive our deontological judgments. Uh, Josh is a moral reformer, and I think he's, his idea of moral reform would be for all of us to end up over here making our cold Spock-like moral judgments and not these rapid, fast, emotional, e evolutionarily laden sorts of judgments, right? Um, the, 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 the semantic he doesn't put it in these terms, but, but he thinks that, what's, that there's a system that's driving our, our, our utilitarian judgments that's all just cold and abstract and impersonal. And this just looks for all the world like the episodic semantic distinction to me. Right? Um, and he appeals to things like Trope and Lieberman's temporal construal effects, the fact that we tend to think about things in the distant future more abstractly than things that are close to us, so that we put things at some, or at spatial distance from ourselves rather than close to us. And that's all part of justifying this view about how we make moral decisions for Josh Green. So, so Green developed this battery um, to show that we make more deontological judgments in high personal conflict situations than in low conflict and impersonal situations. So what's a, uh, so personal scenarios are one that involve a high degree of personal involvement. So for instance, I, have, I push somebody onto the tracks to stop an oncoming trolley. I'm personally engaged. An impersonal one would be something like, I pull a switch at some distance or I hire somebody else to go push them off, or something like that. Um, high conflict scenarios tend to pit these, day on, low conflict scenarios are kind of irrelevant. They're like, you can take this guy to the hospital, he's bleeding all over the place, but he's going to mess up your car, should you take him to the hospital? That one's easy, and they are, everyone gets all of those right. But the really difficult ones are when you put, pit these things together. You've got to smother the baby to save the four people who are with you. Which one of those are you going to do? Here's, here are our results, one, one slide. Controls are the lighter, the, the amnesic subjects are the darker ones. What really matters is over, over in these situations rather than in these. Here we're just comparing per, impersonal and personal. The first thing to note is that unlike what Darwin would have suggested, there wasn't any hesitation in answering these questions. Amnesics got it. They understood what was at stake, and they gave us answers. Right? So they can do this. The second thing is that, like controls, they make fewer utilitarian judgments in the personal situations than they do in the impersonal one. That's a, whatever the reason for that is, they exhibit this quirk of human moral decision making. All right? They also make more utilitarian judgments in the high conflict rather than the low conflict cases but that's kind of to be expected, uh, I think, in these situations. Anyhow, but nonetheless, they exhibit that quirk. But what makes re what's really interesting is um, they do, in fact, seem to make more utilitarian judgments, both here and here, than do controls. Right? And that would be consistent with the Josh Green hypothesis, um, because they're making more um, utilitarian judgments in cases where the rest of us would be um, uh, held off by our emotional reactions to things. But if you look, all of this effect is really being driven by those four guys that are clustered way up there at the top, and it's the same guys 
more, mostly the same guys that are yanking us up down here as well. And when you look at all of those and you graph them against their deficits, there's no correlation between the extent of the deficit and their willingness to be utilitarian responders. That is, the worst, the worst case that we've got over here in terms of their episodic memory deficit is the best, is the most utilitarian of the bunch. And over here, the most damaged in terms of episodic memory deficit is also maxing out the utilitarian answers. So why this is happening, I don't know. But there, and, and the other guys that make these answers are scattered evenly between them. So what's driving this, we're not sure, but it doesn't appear to be their episodic memory problem. The rest of these guys are right around the 50th percentile on this stuff. So episodic imagining does not drive deontological moral judgment in personal high conflict situations. It's not this episodic imagining of our future that's doing the work. There's no correlation between the extent of the episodic deficit and the tendency to give those kinds of judgments. Now, it raises the question, what's going on and what's driving this effect? It might be that there are ways of imagining the future that aren't episodic in nature. That's one possibility. It might be that there are other kinds of systems that are involved in making moral decisions that don't involve episodic memory. And it should be said on Josh's behalf that he never said it was episodic memory in particular. But nonetheless, these things were all pointing to this test, and it turns out that the test didn't work. That's, where, that's I guess, really what I'll say about it at this point. Um, so just to summarize, um, episodic memory does not appear to be necessary to know that there's an A series and a B series. Um, it's not required for us to escape a presentist or hedonist moral outlook. Um, it's not required for us to control our impulses or to make rational risk calculations. Um, it's not required for us to invest the future with value. It's not required for us to delay discount or to, uh, or to show this modification of delayed discounting in some cases. And it doesn't seem to be necessary to make moral decisions or to modulate our moral decisions with our episodic future imagining. So we've got this story about people with episodic amnesia that have lost, become stuck in time, trapped in a permanent present. And I made the claim at the very beginning that I think that's a gross overstatement of the situation that these people find themselves in. There's clearly something wrong with going wrong with them. Um, these are not people who live on their own. For the, they don't live on their own. They require care. They can't go out on their own and move about in the world. Their, their lives are severely influenced by the fact that they have this deficit. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that that's not true. But the question is, what's wrong? Um, and, and one way of characterizing what's wrong with them is to say that somehow their world has been shrunk to a, a point in time. Um, and that's a metaphor that we've accepted and, and used over and over and over again. But we haven't tested that, that hypothesis. And now what we've been doing with kind of off-the-shelf questions and some things that we've made up ourselves is to just try to chip away at that and ask whether these, this metaphor is really apt in these cases. And I think we're beginning to suggest that this is no longer the way that we ought to describe these people. What I really need to do, and I'm not going to be able to do it for you today, or maybe even in the foreseeable future, is to provide a positive story about what the episodic system is in fact doing and what these people have in fact lost that it leaves them so debilitated in the rest of their lives. But I can say that this thread that we've got going in cognitive science about episodic memory and its role in our life needs to be revised on the basis of these uh, final thoughts. Just as we've thought, by the way, that our thinking about the past, memory, is not one kind of thing, but has to be divided into many different kinds of things. One of the classic cases that Churchland gave in favor of a kind of revisionary eliminativism about, about cognitive capacities in the face of neuroscience. I think we might be at a point where we have to recognize that when we talk about future thought, that we're also not talking about a monolithic thing, but rather that there are many systems in the brain that are responsible for dealing with the future. Episodic memory is maybe one of them. Uh, the episodic system is may maybe one of them. Um, uh, but we're still not exactly clear what it contributes that the other ones do not. And answering that question, I think, will really help us to clarify what these capacities are and what other sorts of systems uh, we've got. So, but I, what I really want to leave you with is just the thought that these guys are not stuck in time, um, that they can make prudential and moral decisions, and that they can make them like the rest of us, including the quirks. Um, and the, and uh, forget these. I, I think all I want to say right now is that this is not insignificant for their status as people. 
and their ability to make decisions for themselves, their ability to be trusted to, to make their own decisions about how they would like to act or what they would like to do. And that's non-trivial for the, the personal lives of these individuals who have been altered in their standing in the space of causes. We're still looking for figuring out exactly how they've been altered in the space of reasons. And that's where I'll end. So. I think it's a perfectly reasonable question whether they're able to perform when we bring them into Baycrest and give them a series of tests and whether they're able to translate the strategies that they use to solve these puzzles that we're giving them into solving real honest to God puzzles in their lives. Mm -hmm. That's, that is a very, I think just an absolutely crucial question um, uh, for, for getting at this. And, and it would, when you think about how to address that question, and at times, I wonder, you know, there, there are lots of questions I'd like to ask about Casey, like could he quit smoking, for example? Um, what, what if you did take him to a casino and gave him 200 bucks? Does it all disappear uh, in a matter of seconds? Or, you know, 200 on bread, you know? Uh, or does he, in fact, dish it out slowly over the course of the day? I, I think that one thing that I would really love to see happen um, is to get an ethologist involved in this and have somebody spend, I mean, Casey's no longer with us, but, uh, but, but these other guys are, and, uh, and, and, and women. Um, uh, it would be very interesting to get some ethologists and people who are good at observing behavior in its natural habitat and characterizing what the daily life of somebody with episodic amnesia is really like. Um, because I think the only thing, you know, most of what we know about everyone with these kinds of cognitive deficits comes from isolated experiments done behind the scenes, and I, I would really like to see a study of what, what, what their real life looks like. In, in many cases, we tried to devise tasks that, that made use of stuff that was relevant to them and that seemed personally significant. But I, I, I think you're exactly, exactly right, and I would love to have the answers to those questions. And, I, and maybe, maybe we can work on getting Shane and, 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 uh, to, 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 to try to push forward on something like that, because I, Ultimately, if we care about their personhood and their ability to do things like sign a contract or, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, that's what's at stake here is, is their autonomy as a human, as a, as a person. And, uh, and we really don't want to just know how they perform on the floating task. We want to know how they live. Um, then again, if you had an ethologist following me around for a while, or everyone in this room around for a while, you might start having doubts about their rational agency as well. But uh, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess we'd have to have some normative data to, to figure out uh, what the typical person is actually like, not when they're being asked questions, but when they're actually moving about in the world and doing what they do. This is just a, uh, a small. I'm wondering how much individual differences there would be between different people who have the same kind of people. Uh, it, it, what, what, it, what inspired it was thinking about the life and all the stuff and how, how that, that might vary quite a bit. I don't know. But I was just wondering, is, do you have any, is there any knowledge about that? Sort of 
Um, not that I know of. Um, uh, but yes, there's, I mean, one thing that you deal with in cognitive neuropsychology is that you're dealing with, I mean, it's just part of, as a philosopher of science, what's occasionally been mystifying to me in all of this is it's a, it's a sweet science. It's a, it's a delicate art, this business. Um, and uh, um, uh, you're dealing with a, a population of people, many of whom you haven't seen until they have some brain damage. So you don't know really where they started. Um, they're all over the place in terms of personality type. Um, uh, and you don't know whether the personality that you're watching right now is the personality that they had before. I mean, you can ask their folks, or, and you might have some data or, or around, but usually you haven't, you haven't done it extensively in the way that you can with non-human organisms. The damage to these brains is very different one person to the next. KC's brain is really quite um, uh, extensively damaged, but other of these subjects have more focal hippocampal damage. So, so one source of variability is just the kind of, of, of deficits. And then I, I have to also acknowledge, I'm, I'm a bit of an externalist about, about the mind, um, that, that these people exist in different social environments, um, uh, some more supportive than others, and that that can make a huge difference, not just to the behavior that you see, but their long-term long prospects. Um, uh, and uh, and so so yeah, you you they're they're going to be very very different from one another. And how you cluster them into a group and say, okay, this one is impaired enough, um, but not impaired on these other things. Uh, uh, that every everyone is a snowflake, um, and 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 figuring out how to put them together is a, is I think a very delicate matter and a very interest. I think just an interesting puzzle for philosophers of science. How do you do this? Uh, and do it in a way that that that, um, uh, that you're pretty confident that what you learn is lasting, rather than something that's just an artifact of the couple of people that you happen to have put together into your study. It's messy stuff, uh, but but you know also like you don't you can't open a textbook in neuroscience, starting any cognitive chapter without it beginning with Phineas Gage, H.M. Um, they, are the, they are the anchor points that we use to drive the entire research program. And so uh, we need the eggs, right? um, to the Woody Allen joke. Wow. That was super fantastic, and I, and I learned a lot. I, I want to ask a newbie question. If you want to set it aside, because it's too much of a newbie question. So the way you characterized episodic versus semantic memory uh, really surprised me. Uh, not because I thought it was wrong, it's just I hadn't heard these things aligned in, uh, as you had them. So there seemed to be self versus other, events, episodes versus facts, and emotionally loaded versus cool. So and then you also said that you were kind of sus you were beginning to suspect that maybe there was something awry with the contract. So a, why do these three belong together, and uh, and if they don't, is that what sort of awry with the the whole idea? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, they they belong together. That that what I just what I did there in my little primer was I turned to Endel Talding's discussion of what episodic, the episodic semantic distinction was and said, here's, here's basically what you would get in a textbook um, of the, the characters of, of these things. Why did they come together? Because of people like KC. <laughs> um, episodic amnesia is the, is the kind of thing, is the kind of deficit that KC has. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and similarly in these other S subject. And it's the fact that we found these dissociations that, that leads us to class. What they see, you know, all of this is inference to the best explanation. You got a bunch of tests, you run them on a bunch of tests. The best paper for KC is actually Shana Rosenbaum's 2005 summary of like all of the data about KC. And you'll find a big table in that thing that lists every major relevant psychological test that it was given to Casey, who had a 30-year career as an experimental subject for, for um, these, these researchers. And so has been through, as you might imagine, a tremendous number of, of, of tests. And, and, and this chart just sort of categorizes, you know, you'll go down, it's like 10 of 10, 10 of 10, 10 of 10, 10 of 10, 0 of 10. 
<laughs> one of eight, you know, and, 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 then, and then back to 10 of 10, 10 of 10, 10 of 10, 10 of 10. And so, you know, what you're trying to do in these cases is you find a bunch of tests on which they fail, a bunch of tests on which they succeed. And then on the assumption that you're dealing with a pure deficit of some sort, you posit some cognitive faculty that is common to all of the things on which they fail, uh, but that is, in, that is necessary for none of the things on which they succeed. Right? And, um, and so, and like I said, we're all going to fail some things on tests, and, and it's a, but that's, that's where these, that's how these things cluster together, and that's, I think that's the story about why they fit together. Just it's the best story about dissociation evidence that we've got from these patients, these, and these individuals with episodic. That's very helpful. And your suspicions? Uh, oh, my suspicions about, about the category are just that, um, you know, it's become associated with this mental time travel <coughs> thing in particular. Uh, some suspicions have to do with the fact that when, when I give this definition at the bottom, it, it refers to consciousness. Um, uh, and it says that you, there's a particular form of consciousness that's involved in like transferring yourself back in time, and I guess I have some hesitation about grounding a psychological category in something as undetectable as a specific form of, of consciousness. And um, and then I think that these sort of crude formula, crude-ish uh, um, uh, formulations are are that there's some uh, more subpersonally appropriate characterization of what's gone wrong with the brains of these subjects than something that's so folk psychologically laden as something like episodic memory. Um, and, and these experiments that we've done, I just keep thinking, this is nothing like what I thought it would. When I, as a philosopher, first read Endel Talvin talking about this thing, and Sudendorf and Corvallis writing about this stuff, or uh, 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 Atats and O'Neill writing about this kind of stuff, what we're finding is nothing like what those guys seem to be relying on when they describe the, the, the way that these people would be or what episodic memory is and what it does for us. And that suggests to me that, we're, that our characterization is, is not accurate and, 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 and that maybe we need to revise it. But, but, but you know, my, my problem at the moment, and you, you, know, you and I talked about this earlier, Stefan, um, is that I don't, I don't yet know what to replace, <laughs> replace it with. And so for the purposes of this and communicating with a wide audience, I'll just start with the old end of stuff. But I feel like I have to, to, to warn, you know, just to, to, to say, uh, um, you know, this is not solid, this is not rock solid science. This is science in flux. And we should expect that at this stage of the game. It's not a criticism of Endel or anything. It's just what happens when science keeps changing. Tim? Oh, okay. You're, you're what? Okay, so it seems that the competing uh, account that episodic memory uh, is necessary for future thinking uh, makes the prediction that in typical developments, uh, episodic memory ought to be related to being able to project yourself into the future. So that individual differences, for example, in episodic memory are related to your ability to project yourself in the future. So you might see some interesting effects within but it seems like you would make the prediction that there should really be no relationship between uh, episodic memory and future thinking. So I guess one question is, when you look at typical development, is there any evidence for a relationship between episodic memory and future thinking, or is there no relationship? Wait, I didn't mean to suggest that there's no relationship between episodic memory and future thinking. Um, uh, I do think that these things go together. I'm just not sure yet what we mean when we say that they've got deficits in future thinking. Uh -huh. Because they can think about the future. <laughs> um, and they can make decisions about the future. And what it seems to be is that if you ask them to, you know, you might, what my friend uh, Jeff Zox at one point put it to me, uh, he said, it's thinking about events. And they could be in the past and they could be in the future, but what seems to be lost is like event construction. Something, something like that. And so I didn't mean to suggest that they're, that they're damaged with the past, but not with the future. I did mean to suggest that they're damaged in these dimensions, but not yeah. with like, uh, knowledge of other minds. And I don't know about spatial location. No, I'm right. sure that there's an answer to that question somewhere. I just haven't actually bothered to look at it. But, but um, maybe to take one particular example from your talk, so if you think about something like the risk-taking or impulsivity measures that you used, 
would there be a prediction? It seems to me the competing account would make the prediction that individual differences in episodic memory ought to be related to performance on those things. Whereas it's not clear to me that the kind of data you're showing would make such a strong prediction about there being a relationship. Maybe there is. Maybe no, there is. to me, this is a great question. It's one that we've, I, I've had a few meetings with people trying to figure out how we would test it, maybe on Mechanical Turk or something. I'm not sure the right way to do it. Because you're gonna need huge samples to make this go, but what you really want to do is see whether individual variation in the vivacity of one's episodic recall. That's the other thing, is doing something like Mechanical Turk. Like if you, it, it, you, need to, you need to test their memory, and you need to know whether it's accurate, yeah. and, you, and you need to know whether they're just spinning a story or whether it's, you know, uh, it's just hard to do that. And you also want to compare them to one another, so if you, you really want them to remember something that you, anyhow, we haven't figured out yet how to do the test that you want to do, but we've thought about doing the test that you want to do, which is to look, get a huge population and look at us all in terms of the extent to which we're you know, very big detailed, rich memories of our past and rich imaginings of our future. Uh, we also thought about looking at, you know, so we, we were talking at lunch, some people when they read say that they, you know, they create a world in, in their imagination. Other people say they just love the wordplay and they don't even, they, they think it's bizarre that other people have this kind of creative ability um, to, to construct this world. And I think it would be really interesting, first, it, it seems to me just from talking to people after giving this talk a couple of times, that there is a huge range of individual variability in this. And then the question of whether the differences there would correlate with differences in like discounting. Boy, wouldn't that be a tidy hypothesis? That would be so tidy if it were true. And, uh, and I, I think it'd be really interesting to, to find out. I just haven't done it. Just a, a quick second uh, a comment about yeah. uh, It seems to me that you talked about having this sort of dissociation. You set it up in terms of dissociation in the beginning, but I think maybe you actually have the, the makings for a double dissociation. Just there are very likely people who have perfectly intact episodic memory, but very steep temporal discounting functions. Um, so you may, you may have sort of that, right? Oh. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, my guess is that we could find it in both directions. Yeah. But that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting. I'd never thought of that. But yeah, that's I, that sounds plausible to me, and it would be worth looking to see whether these things are entirely dissociable from one another. Yeah. Thank you. That's really that's a really good thought. Oh, his was a really good thought. Oh, yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay, man. Everybody else has insulted too. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you start your question yeah, over? Yeah, I was still on insulting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering whether Rob's being serious. Or not, but apparently he's not. Okay, good. So the, the way you frame the discussion about saying, okay, we have a concept of personhood, the person in the space of reasons versus the sort of cognitive capacities they have. And um, so once you've gotten a sort of more fine grained conception of what is actually associated with these kinds of deficits, you've shown that people behave just like everyone else in a wide variety of ways. Um, but I think if you, so the question going back to how should we think of them as persons, one move might be to say, well, maybe we need a fine-grained conception of personhood and things like culpability. So maybe for somebody who has this sort of memory deficit, you'd still hold them culpable if they punch somebody right after they hit them, or you know, like sort of immediate short-term action. But maybe you wouldn't hold them culpable for other kinds of actions that require long-term planning. Yeah. Like, they might have they might have the sort of future directed behavior, but you still end up with a sort of fractured conception of agency where they have some aspects of that, but not others. That is so much better than Rob's question. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think that's right. Um, we tend to, for in legalistic ways, think about agency as on or off, yeah. mm -hmm. and 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 that what that if we were to try to devise the legal system in a way that took advantage of the best cognitive science, and maybe cognitive science is a little too young for that mm -hmm. project to really be taken seriously. 
But we should not ask, are they competent or not competent? The question is, competent for what? And we should think about personhood in a cloud of space. And we're all, we're all in different places in there. And you might have somebody who's been, um, the, the metaphor that I would use before is like, you know, the, their position in the space has shifted or uh, has changed, but that doesn't mean that they're out of the space of reasons or, or something like that. And so you, you would like recognize a kind of narrow domain within which they can be perfectly counted on to handle themselves, but a domain outside of which they cannot. And I think that a properly combined like legal system with cognitive science would have to take something like that form. And, and to me, like this is just one little chip, one little chip in the kind of project that would be required to really characterize that kind of, kind of space. That's, I think that's exactly right. Um, Yeah, I have a general impression, I just wondered how true it was, uh, that, that lack of uh, episodic memory is made up for with semantic memory, generally, and that uh, when an episode happens, maybe they modify their ideas about reality, and, they, and that modified idea carries on where when the episode disappears, and uh, so they depend on their Yeah, so the, the, the finding on KC, and I was just very quick when I was going, again, these people are different uh, from one another. But in the case of KC, there's an anterior grade deficit that's um, really severe for episodic memory, but also for semantic memory. I mean, it is the case that he has managed to learn a few things um, uh, since, but, uh, but it's very impaired relative to, so he's actually got both going forward. What's distinctive about KC is that he appears to maintain much of his semantic memory from before. And he's definitely leaning an awful lot on that. And then, um, uh, the, uh, but has also uh, lost all of those episodic memories. And um, so I think you're exactly, part of what's interesting here is if we start thinking, you know, for some of these people, this is kind of an evolutionary question. They think like, what's the function? Uh, I don't like these kinds of questions in general, but what's the function of episodic memory? Right? And um, and there it seems like to answer that question, what you want is there's something, and, and, and they think about it in, in evolutionary terms as well. Like why, why would we have this separate capacity from semantic memory when it's so you know, energy intensive and et cetera? What does it do that semantic memory cannot do? And so the fact that you can comp you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's nothing it does, but it does it faster uh, or, um, uh, you know, but, but clearly, much of this decision making, much of this thinking can be done on a semantic basis. And I think that the answers to those Zimbardo questions, the more I present this material, I look at it and I say, they're just telling you the moral rules that they've learned. That's what you're getting out of them. It's a semantic report. But then I think there's also just a question, how much of our day-to-day -day life, if you ask us, should you get your work done before you go to bed? It's like, Yes, um, <laughs> and, um, and that, that much, of, much of our life involves semantic reporting. And I think it's just an open question how much of what we do is being driven by this, this putative other system that's emotionally hot and vivid. And, and then the, the question really becomes, what, what does that allow you to do that you couldn't do with your procedural memories and your semantic memories? And my guess is that we can do an awful lot in this world and get along very adaptively. Endo used to make the provocative claim that, that these guys are among us, that we have, we have people living among us who, are, who lack episodic memory, and that they're moving about in the world just like the rest of us doing just fine. That seems to be what all your examples but again, these guys are not, I, I, I really, I just have to insist, I, I would feel irresponsible if I left here without saying they, they, are, they, they, they are impaired as, they, they, they're, they're, they're um, what's the, I don't want to use any really latent, I, I, sorry, disability studies is uh, inside me in, in many ways, but uh, they're very different from the rest of us <laughs> in ways that many of us would consider undesirable were it us. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether or not some of the difficulty in sort of 
uncovering your old episodic memory and um, sort of future thinking and planning is that people can rely, even if you did have a deficit, say, in episodic memory, you can compensate, say, with an intact semantic memory system. So both systems push you in the same direction to behave in ways that are consistent with future thought. So one way to get around that, perhaps, it's just, you know, my speculation, but if you took somebody, say, who had semantic dementia, now all of a sudden you're left with performance relying solely perhaps on an episodic system. And so you get sort of a pure sense of what it is that episodic memory actually contributes to uh, these, these sorts of tasks. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's an interesting suggestion. The relationship between semantic and episodic, I, you know, I only talked about it as a single dissociation. You know, we got rid of the episodic, the semantic remains. And then there's, there are claims that, that you can have the, the flip story. Um, I'm not expert in that. Um, usually it's the case that there are people, like I think the reports, that, the reports that I have looked at, there are people who are impaired in semantic, um, uh, but they appear to be more impaired in episodic. Here's what I really want to say. Um, Endo used to, Tolving used to claim that um, episodic memory was dependent upon or supervened upon or somehow emerged from uh, semantic, semantic memory. And, and, and he thought that this was, in a way, a conceptual truth. If I have a memory standing on the street corner holding an umbrella in the rain, um, I, it's not clear how I could have that memory without knowing what an umbrella is, without knowing what a corner is, without knowing what rain is. And, and so, so like in a way, at a conceptual level, and I don't mean to, to go off, you know, like to make a kind of philosophical a priori argument about the structure of the human mind or anything, but it seems like our conception of what episodic memory, episodic memories are made of detail that, that, that seems to require things like concepts. And, and so I have some difficulty understanding the claim that one could have a dissociation going in the other direction. Um, and in fact, I'm even, uh, part of the reason why I am, I'm, well, I'm, I'm interested in learning from other people who understand this stuff better than I am. I mean, I'll just stop there. I, I think that, that episodic memory is, it, it, in some ways, really requires a semantic system to be in place. Um, so there was a few but, years ago, like there were cases of semantic dimension that challenged that notion individuals were thought to have pretty much intact episodic memory, but nonetheless, they couldn't recognize objects as, you know, the way you arrived at the memory. And this caused controversy in that very model of helping like you were suggesting. Yeah. You know, how could you ever have a semantic deficit while not having an accompanying episodic deficit? Yeah, it's, so, but, it, but I think you're exactly right that, that let's, let's, let's bracket the, the antecedents of the conditional. It's true. <laughs> okay. Now, could you use those guys to learn something about how episodic memory works in the absence of semantic? I think the answer is probably yes. But, but man, trying to run experiments on people with, semantic, with really severe semantic deficits, I, 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 we find it hard to devise the right kind of studies to do with KC um, uh, that aren't confounded by the, the deficits. And somehow, uh, I, that seems to be a whole area of expertise in which I, I look at it and just think, I'm not even sure where I get started on that one. Um, but, but it's a good thought, yeah. Stefan? Just wondered in the, you know, the broader conception of episodic memory, the way it started out in 72 with, when Andrew Tolding introduced the term, it was simply a memory for something that happened at a particular time in a particular place. So it was time and place. And it's absolutely true that in recent years it has all gone towards the focus on mental time travel. I wonder about the aspect of space, you know, mental space travel, you could call it. It's not what people investigate, but on the level of, in the, in the context of amnesia research and in the research even more on the hippocampus, people have wondered a lot about what is the role of the representation of space, even in imaginations of future scenarios. Do I need to have an internal representation of space to project myself in the future? And so from that perspective, I wonder maybe we've been misguided by thinking so much about time in episodic memory, but rather more about the fundamentals as space as perhaps being more relevant. And we talked about briefly about some of the work that Ellen McGuire, for instance, is doing on that, who's 
promoting that view. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think thinking about this in spatial terms is very enticing. The one thing that makes me balked just slightly uh, about this is, um, it was really, I, I saw this exchange once with Lynn Liddell and somebody else where they were pointing out, you know, Sue Corkin has this, this later paper, What's New with Patient Dane Chan, and in that paper she asks him to like, draw the house that he lives in, and, uh, gets it right, and, um, and so there appears to be a fair amount of spatial, in HM, uh, a fair, uh, like a fair amount of spatial stuff, at least residual spatial ability in those cases. And but that could be semantic, right? I mean, uh, uh, that's actually some of those findings would argue that it's semantic knowledge, overlearned knowledge about the past. Yeah, it but is. Once, if you look at your classic amnesic patient, they will have difficulty reorienting themselves in a new environment. I mean, every amnesic patient would have really difficulties if you put them into a hospital to find back their way to the room where they were. So I'm wondering whether that might be sort of, in a way, you would can sort of see the agency argument a bit more playing out perhaps also in everyday life. Can you, can you just help me real quickly to imagine a, a task that would look at the relevance of spatial organization to like future imagining or future decision making? Uh, do you have, a, do you have a, a kind of task in mind or a kind of decision in mind that that you think would help to, to bring this to the this problem to the front if that's what the problem was. I mean, it would be something, again, I haven't done that research, I'm, I'm yeah, only yeah. following it from the periphery, but it would be something along the lines, imagine yourself in this scene, what would you, ex or you present a scene, what do you expect outside of its boundaries of what you see? You know, you see a park bench, could you sort of imagine what it's, beyond that you could also expand that in navigational terms. If you were to see a picture of a city, what would it be like to walk from this place A to place B on that platform? That sort of thing. I don't, again, I don't think people, I mean, people have studied navigation a lot and a little bit, um, well, not so much with a future focus, but I think that's partly. Some people might say it might even stop, start at the element of the scene not necessarily dynamic, just to imagine yourself in, in a situation. scene that already, that what might be sort of where the cracks or the challenges arise. Yeah, I mean, it would be really, Casey, I, I mean, I, 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 I hear I'm relying on a videotaped interview that he did with Endel at some point, but I do remember at some point him telling him how to get from Toronto to Mississauga for example, uh, but that's not future oriented or it, it's not a novel situation. It might well be that he's repeating a route that he's taken a million different times. Is that, that's what you were going to say. I would say it's over semantic learned, memory. Right? Overlearned so, uh, semantic yeah. memory, yeah. Um, but I guess and we can continue that this conversation some other time later, perhaps. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we're kind of at time. So there are a couple of people 